Hello, and welcome to the Social Psychic Radio Show, featuring Jason Zook. In uncertain times, we must change our focus and priorities. This show will highlight social justice issues with the goal of expanding minds and increasing unity, love, and mutual respect for ourselves and our planet. We support the Black Lives Matter movement. Our show aspires to promote social spirituality, which simply means that by coming together, we can solve any of our problems, including the goal of bringing an end to all forms of hate, discrimination, bias, or oppression. We must protect our environment, reform our criminal justice system, and protect every citizen from police brutality. When we come together, it becomes possible to bridge the gaps that plague our society and divide us from within. We the people means everyone. Hello and welcome to the Social Psychic Radio Show. This is Jason Zook. It's a great pleasure that I welcome special guest Don Joseph Goway to the show today. As seen on the Dr. Oz Show today, Huffington Post, ABC, NBC, Thrive Global, and more. Don is the best-selling author of The End of Stress, Four Steps to Rewire Your Brain, and Mystic Cool, Neuroplasticity, Thought, and the Power of Attitude, published by Simon & Schuster. He's the editor of the newly published book, Stop Fixing Yourself, Wake Up, All is Well, written by the late Anthony DeMello and published by Beyond Words. Don is the executive director of the DeMello Spirituality Center. Previous to the DeMello Spirituality Center, Don managed the Department of Psychiatry at Stanford Medical School, ran a regional emergency room services system, and for 12 years headed ICAH, which received the 2005 Excellence in Medicine Award from the American Medical Association for pioneering a breakthrough approach to overcoming catastrophic life events. Don has worked with some of the most stressful situations on earth, with people facing terminal illness, parents struggling with the loss of a child, prisoners serving life sentences, and refugees of the genocidal war in Bosnia, struggling with extreme post-traumatic stress. With these credentials, they show how Don truly is an expert when it comes to managing stress, and through the DeMello teachings, Don is helping thousands around the globe stress less and live a happy, healthy, and more fulfilled life. It's with great pleasure I welcome Don to the show. Welcome to the show, Don. Uh, thank you, Jason. I'm fascinated by your background. I mean, Stanford University and then all the other amazing things you've done in your life. I just want to ask you, my first question is where you are right now, would you have envisioned that you would have accomplished all these things in your life when you were younger? No, <laughs> but you know, the, one of the things about accomplishments is that, is that, you know, you get one behind you and then there's a new challenge in front of you. And so you're always moving forward, working with the next thing that's on your plate, the next thing that you're um, challenged to learn, to, to develop some expertise around, particularly when you're, when you're devote, you know, what your, your occupation is working with people, helping people, learning from people. So, I don't really reflect, uh, reflect too much on myself in that regard. You know, I, I got into this business really the hard way. Um, it, back, it happened back when I was at Stanford. And the business that I'm talking about is the field of psychospirituality. You know, there's been a great convergence of psychology, neuroscience, and spirituality. When I say spirituality, I mean a practical spirituality, the kind of thing that's really focusing us on our self-worth, focusing in on our, our capacity for inner peace and to love one another. And all of those fields, those important fields of, of human endeavor have merged. They're on the same page finally. They don't contradict each other as they once did. And so I, I, if I were to go back when I was younger and you were to ask me, I would end up in this field, I would have said, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I, don't th I don't think that's uh, at all where I'm headed. But what happened to me, and I think this happens to a lot of people, is um, I, I got hit with, with life, you know, threw me a curveball. I, I call it uh, my perfect storm of stress. 
It was what I experienced this back in the 1980s, late 1980s. I lost my job, my executive level position at Stanford Medical School. I gotten fired because the chairman of the department and I, I was his chief operating officer. Uh, the chairman and I didn't see eye to eye in a lot of different things. And I was a young Turk in those days. And he was, uh, he was a stubborn person himself. And we banged heads a lot. And he finally got tired of it and fired me. And I was married. I had four kids and my marriage was in trouble uh-huh. and drinking too much and dealing with my own stress in that way. And, you know, suddenly my w- life was coming apart at the seams and it seemed that there was really virtually nothing I could do about it. The doctors told me to prepare for the worst, that the, ca- the, the tumor wasn't cancerous, but it was in a position in which the surgery could do enough collateral damage that the doctor said I may never work again. You know, I'd be living off of a walker. I'd have t- trouble with uh, with my face, my face being frozen. Lots of things like, lots of very unfortunate and miserable things like that. And so they couldn't do the surgery for two weeks. And during that two week period, I ruminated about all of the horror that could possibly fall upon my life and my family and my children we could have ended up homeless. I'd wake up at three o'clock in the morning and I'd stare out into the cold, dark night. And uh, all I saw was gloom and doom. When I looked out, there was like, the, there was this big black hole outside the window, just waiting to suck me in, you know? And so one night, two weeks into this, I had a question occur to me. Um, and it was a pretty simple question, but it, but, it had, it, but it was a question of enormous impact. I asked, which was worse? You know, the, the dire circumstances that may or may not happen to me, depending on what, how the surgery went, or the abject fear that I'd been in every day for two weeks, every day, all day long. And it was obvious to me that the, what was worse was the abject fear because that was what was front and center. And I could feel how it was deplete, depleting my, my emotional and my physical strength to, to come through this, it, you know, to give myself the, the odds of coming through this in a really good way. And so I had learned an approach from one of the America's great psychologists, Carl Rogers. And um, the approach was very simple. It's when you're in a high level of fear or, or or you're in a deep depression, I think I was oscillating between both, to face it. Face it simply by allowing yourself to feel what you're feeling, to instead of resisting the feeling, to embrace the feeling. And as you embrace it, to be conscious of the fact, the reality, that the greater part of what you're going through is happening in you, not necessarily to you. Um, and so I could see that, you know, the distress I was in was largely emotional. And the process is, it starts with looking, you know, getting in touch with the thoughts that you're thinking and seeing how these thoughts that you're thinking are turning into the emotional state that you're experiencing. And I, it, it became really obvious to me that the gloom and doom thoughts I were thinking was creating an enormous amount of anxiety that was bottoming out as depression. And so I allowed it to come up, I embraced it. And I thought, you know, naively, if I did that, I really trusted the psychologist. He said it would eventually dissolve. He said, when you make, when we make something con- unconscious conscious, it weak- weakens the unconsciousness, the unconscious uh, event. And so I thought, okay, that's what's going to happen. Well, actually, it swelled. It got worse. The pain, the, the emotional upset I was in expanded. And I had no choice but to write it out. I have a grandson who lives in Hawaii, and he, he's a surfer. And he talks about when you hit a big wave, when you're out there in the water and you jump on that big wave, once you get on top of it, you got to ride it all the way into to shore or to the bottom, whichever way it takes you, because... There, it's a, you're at the point of no return. Well, I did that. And I wrote it in. Unfortunately, I came to shore. And when I came to shore, the first thing I noticed was that the upset had passed. And I was conscious of the fact that, well, you know what the Buddhists say is true. 
everything passes, especially upsetting emotions. If you write them out, if you don't continue to recycle them and endless loop them through your mind. And but then the fear came back little, you know, 20 minutes later, I did the same thing. I did this about four or five times. And at the end of that process, I was calm. And when I looked out the window, I didn't see this black hole about to suck me in. I saw this beautiful evening, you know, this beautiful three o'clock in the morning with the moonlight shimmering off of this lovely oak tree in the front of my house. And it made, it made the, the scene look almost sacred. So I made up my mind right then and there. I was going to let go of fear and depression and any other upset that came along in this way, in this simple way, whenever it raised its head. And I had four weeks to go before the surgery. And during that four week period, I didn't indulge one fearful thought. It, not one trapped me in its web. I certainly had emo uh, fearful emotions arise, but I, I just continued to process them. And by the time I showed up for the surgery, I was in a completely different mindset. I wasn't afraid of anything at that point. I was very optimistic and surgery turned out to be a complete success, sparing me a life of disability. Thank God. Thank God. And, you know, the neuroscientists back then, they didn't take much heed in the mind-body connection like they do now. But if the, if the modern day, the, you know, the current neuroscience were around then, they would have told me that my shift in mindset, that shifted my attitude, created that mind-body shift within me that gave me the greatest chance for a positive, you know, good medical outcome. Well, this was a huge spiritual discovery for me. And, and I even got my job back, you know, <laughs> because I had to, to get my golden parachute, you know, from Stanford, I had to show up during that four week period and finish a project that nobody else could finish. The people in the Dean's office were noticing, here's this guy, you know, he's lost his job. He's been diagnosed with a brain tumor and he's showing up to work and he's the most positive cheerful, optimistic guy in the whole medical school. And the, the chairman of the department of psychiatry called me over one day, you know, before the surgery. And he said, when you're done with the surgery, I want to give you a job because I need your attitude in this godforsaken department. <laughs> and so I got my job back. But I, I eventually left Stanford and I went to work at the Center for Attitudinal Healing, which you talked about that won the AMA award and worked with people facing even worse situations than I'm facing and coming through it. And it, it taught me the absolute resilience of our human spirit when we lean into it. You know, what you're saying, I it resonates strongly with me because in 2018, I was diagnosed with stage one kidney cancer and I had to go through this mental gymnastics as I called it at the time, that I could take one or two roads for like three weeks. They didn't know if I had stage one or stage four cancer. So I, did, I had to wait till the MRI got done. And we had to wait three weeks. So it's kind of like what you're describing. And I woke up one morning, I was depressed for two weeks. And I sat in this dark funk, but I, I guess one day I just woke up and I said, you know what, I'm not going to die from this. And this isn't going to define me. And I'm going to not, I'm going to take all those negative thoughts that were burrowed in my mind and I'm putting them in a box and locking them away till after I get my surgery done. And I went through all that. And so what you're telling me is exactly like, I feel like I may have done that instinctively in part, because when you're dealing with such a, a hard set of cards to work with, you have to kind of figure out survival and you've got to figure out happiness is a key. Positivity is a part of survival. I feel it strengthens you. It strengthens the spirit. It makes you overcome these horrendous obstacles that people look at you and they scratch their head and say, how did you do that? And one of the things I'll probably say for you, you did it because you were positive and you saw what I probably saw when I went through my cancer diagnosis, which was, this is just one thing and time heals and things that bother us right now, 10 minutes from now probably won't be bothering us anymore. So we've got to just look at the life we have and enjoy the moment we have, but not overthink and not put a lot of negative meaning or attachment to things that don't work out our way we want them to. And I guess my question was, I want to ask you, do you have an opinion about that at all? I know I just said a mouthful, but I, I, I really resonates what you're talking about with me personally. Well, that's beautiful what you went through. You know, it, it comes back to the discovery that we make in those kinds of situations that people make in those kinds of situations that what initially looks like a curse, the worst thing that could have possibly happened to you, 
as you embrace it and move through it, you know, and, and rise to it. Right. And what you're not, you're not actually rising to the situation. You're rising to a power within yourself <laughs> to transform the situation. And at first you don't know if you can do it, but you know, and, and at first, like with me, I started out in abject fear and it, and it, it took me two weeks to figure out like, that's not working. You know, this is, this is not the best choice for me to make. And fortunately, I had that thing, that process that I could grab onto. But at the end of it, I discovered, uh, so I, I, I got so many gifts from that. I got, I woke up, I woke up to the person I was, I became a better father as a result of it. I became a, a better partner you know, as a result of that. And I did, and I finally looked around at Stanford one day, Stanford Medical School. Uh, this was a couple of years after that. And I went, I'm in the wrong place. You know, th this is not where I want to be. This is not where I've born to be. And, and I thought to myself, you know, I, I should, I should just resign the position, you know, give them notice, fair notice, and move on. And, and reach out into the, you know, the universe helped me through the brain tumor. It'll, it'll, it'll help me find my way. And then I remember having the thought like, well, you know, maybe we should sleep on this. And, and my first thought was, if we sleep on this, it'll be 20 years from now and we'll have missed the boat, you know? And so I did. I, I sent in my resignation and I left. And a year later, I was working in the AIDS epidemic, and I was working with when it was at its height uh, uh, during that during that uh, during the eighties in San Francisco, and so eighties and nineties, and met six extraordinary people, people like you, who taught me even strengthened even further my spiritual resolve, my spiritual uh, orientation to whatever happens to be happening. And you know, the fundamental orientation of anything spiritual is a here and now. Orient yourself here and now. Um, I kept telling myself during approaching surgery when I finally got through my fear of right here, right now, I'm okay. Right here, there, nobody's drilled into my head right <laughs> now. And who knows what comes, but at least enjoy this, enjoy this exactly. moment. You know, when I coach people during the, the 2008 economic meltdown, people who were had lost their jobs, people who were about to be face foreclosure papers. Mm -hmm. And the people who made it through that were the people who finally came to the conclusion that, look, at right today, all is well. I, can, I got food in the refrigerator for my kids. Uh, my, I got a roof over my head. And they, when they went out and looked for jobs, they weren't sweating. They weren't desperate. They weren't afraid. They projected this, this confidence. And people that were interviewing them would make comments, God, with everything you're going through, you've showed up in such a great way. And who doesn't want to bring a person into, your, into the challenges of your business who has an attitude like that? And they all succeeded. And the ones that couldn't break out for because of the way in which their brain had been programmed from traumas in their past, they, it, it took them much longer to work out their problems. And I, I wonder if there's a lot. I, I guess perspective really does make a big difference for people. Would you find that in, in, your, in your work with all these various different groups of people that have gone through like life changing moments or, I mean, just whatever type of circumstances that we would look at as our audience would probably think like, Oh my gosh, I can't imagine that dot, dot, dot. Right. And you fill in that black AIDS, AIDS, you know, people dealing with AIDS or cancer or dealing with other things like yourself with your tumor, I guess it changes. I feel like it transforms how one would look at their own spiritual path. And I guess what I want to ask you for you, because you've been around a lot of these different elements, what's been your broad view of spirituality from everything you've experienced in terms of all these life factors that we, we, most of us fear these things because we don't know how we would handle them. But in reality, you shouldn't fear anything. Well, spirituality is about waking up, waking up from the nightmare that we're in. The reality that all the mystics and all the saints and all the poets tell us about is a reality of love, that we're surrounded by, by a radiance. We're surrounded by a loving divinity. 
that if we could come into contact with it every day, it would bring such meaning and such progress to our lives. But what we've been programmed by society to believe is that our happiness, our sense of safety comes from the outside world. Society has, you know, when you, you look at the statistics, what you find is that there's only 4% of the population that say that they're completely happy. Some people say, yeah, sometimes 4%, 4% say they're completely happy all the time. And the irony is the research is showing this even more and more and more is that we were born happy. We were born free, but we've become trapped in limited thinking. You know, we were born with an open heart that stress and fear so, so easily closes. We allow it to so easily close. We were born gifted you know, beings of immeasurable worth, and we often feel like we're not good enough. And in the midst of all of that, there's this divinity of joy within us and surrounding us. And it's almost as if we've all been hypnotized to see what is not there and not see what is there. So, you know, society programs it out of us. That's how it happens. That's how we get into that state of unhappiness. That's why we get we we leave where where our true home is is right here in our heart and go seeking our happiness, go seeking fulfillment in the outside world, and so you know society stamps it us into us the belief that happiness and self worth are found out there in the world, and if we work long and hard enough, ha success will come, and then happiness and fulfillment will follow. And you know we've all swallowed that formula, and after ten years we realize that success has come, but without fulfillment. And we don't even know what fulfillment, we couldn't even define it. Most people can't even define what they mean by fulfillment. <laughs> uh, and that's, you know, that's feeling at life. So spirituality is about waking up. It's waking up to the realization that contrary to what our society has, you know, hammered into us, nothing but absolutely nothing of the world can make us happy. You know, success is not unimportant, of course, but success is not the same as fulfillment. Fulfillment is being at peace, have the capacity to be at peace, even in the midst of a, of a, a, a difficult problem. It's the capacity to love. It's a ca capacity to be compassionate and empathic. It's a ca capacity to be happy. But happiness doesn't come from the world. We got to get that straight. Not the radiance happiness of a child that's constant and makes you smile for no reason. Happiness comes from within you. And the truth is, there's not a single moment in our lives when we don't have everything we need to be happy. And the only reason we're ever unhappy is because we're focused on what we don't have rather than what we have right here, right now, just like what we've been talking about. And, you know, spirituality defines that focusing on what we don't have, being only focused on the outside as attachments. There's so many things we're attached to. We're attached to being praised. We're attached to having objects. We're attached to our reputation and our status in society. So this new book here, Stop Fixing Yourself, that has DeMello's work in it, it helps us to remember and rediscover that truth about ourselves that, that what we're looking for that the world is dis dis has been so disappointing in providing is in here. Inside of and it's not in here someday. It's in here, right here, right now. You're happy already. You don't know it. You're at peace already, but you don't know it. You're just not leaning in into the spiritual reality of what you are. You're not a body. You, you're, you're a spirit. And that means you're not broken. You're not some so problem to be solved. You're okay. And if there's a problem, it's the way that we've been programmed to believe that without something or person or some result, we cannot be happy. It's a false belief. We don't acquire or earn happiness. We don't acquire or earn our, our, our spirit, our heart, our peace. We have it already. That's what spirituality is all about. I, I could not get a better, a better way of having it defined the way you just did through example. And I, I really appreciate that because I think a lot of people don't really understand spirituality because they think it's this ephemeral thing that's like 
out there, but they can't grasp it. And it's a search from within. And I think finding your own true happiness within yourself is a great way of defining, uh, creating a solid base of spirituality within yourself as well. Living in the present moment, being happy now and trying to formulate that so that you, when you do deal with a difficult situation, like a brain tumor or some other catastrophic event, you'll have that solid foundation to rely upon. And I want to yeah. go ahead if you have some now. Well, I was going to say you touched upon it pretty succinctly a minute ago. You know, we've basically been programmed to upset ourselves. So when <laughs> life doesn't go the way our programming demands it should, you know, and that programming in terms of society says you should be a success. Society said you need to be this. The site says you need to look like that. Society says this is who you ought to be, you know, and. And when, it does, when things don't turn out that way, we, we become upset. What happens is there's a part of our brain that thinks that we're at risk. In the moment, it thinks we're at risk because we don't have this or that, or we, we don't look like this, our reputation isn't that. Our brain, the fear center, it's called the amygdala of the brain. It gets, it gets agitated because it thinks our survival is at risk, and it sets off a stress reaction. And that, you know, and so now we're up, this whole program we've had has worked with our brain to wire us to uh, upset ourselves. So you free yourself from that oppressive fear of failing through something very, very simple. It's through awareness. In other words, you step back from the distress, just like you and I've been talking about. But at the same time, you let yourself feel the upset, you know, without fixing it without needing it to change, without trying to turn it into something else. You just, you just allow it to arise. You allow yourself to experience it. And then you understand, you meet it with the understanding that this stress, this upset is happening in me, not to me, but equally that you are not your upset. And as you observe the distress, you, what you will notice is that it passes. And one of the things you have to, to process is one of the upsets that come on top of your upset is you, you're you going to feel judgmental towards yourself. Why am I still getting upset in this way? Why am I still being this fool for, for my emotion, my emotional reactions? And just process, that is just another, another content, another thought process that's leading to upsetting emotions and that it's happening as a result of the way you've been programmed. And then then you will notice that the whole thing passes. And now you are free to enter the here and now. And when you enter the here and now, what you will find is there's always peace in the here and now. There's always joy in the here and now. There's always this heart opening that emerges when we enter the here and now. And that's the spiritual, and that spiritual change, that's, that's, a, a, that's an, an awakening, a moment of awakening. And we wake up in a lot of different ways. You know, we wake up when we step out onto a trail and walk our favorite path through nature. And we feel that incredible feeling of, of wonder and how beautiful the universe is. That's a moment of awakening. When you just said that, I thought about my favorite walk I take at night. Usually I'll walk along the water here in Tampa. And I know my, when I do that, it's my way of like just enjoying the connection we have with like mother earth and the larger spiritual world of what we have, like, you know, the present moment, but then also looking at our connection to nature and being part of earth and looking at the larger connection to things. I don't know how, did you study that in terms of your own spirituality the connection between us and nature and, and our planet and how that works in our, as a healing modality? Yes, absolutely. I think that what, you know, what happens for me, DeMello talks about this a lot. In fact, everything we're talking about here is, is what DeMello. I want to make sure we stay on point. So I feel like yeah. I want to make sure we bring up everything yeah. we want to, you know? Yeah, you're doing a great job. And so this is, uh, yeah, this is what DeMello says. He, he tells, prescribes people, go out and work, walk in nature. Go look at a rose. You, <laughs> One of the things you'll notice about a rose that's different from you is a rose isn't trying to be anything but a rose. It's, it's in sync with its own nature. It's not disappointed with itself, you know? It's just blooming. And when it's done blooming, it dies. You know, well, we, that happens to us. We, yeah. You know, during the day, we'll have a moment of, of awakening and then we'll go back to the grind and then we'll wake up out of that. And one of the things Demela says, you want to see your true nature. He says, you want to see God walk out into nature. 
the, the elements of your true nature are everywhere around you. It's in the light. It's, it's in the way the, the breeze touches your face and cools you down, you know, on a hot day. It's, it's in the beauty of, of all the colors and the mixture of, of life forces all around, you know, plants, trees, water, sky. Uh, yeah, he says, go out and connect it. It's incredibly healing. It calms you down immensely. And there's nothing calmer, uh, excuse me, nothing more healing than peace. Peace is healing. In fact, at the agency where I work, Center for Attitude and no Healing, that won that AMA award, um, they defined health as inner peace and yeah. healing as letting go of fear. Great. So I think about it. anyone you can talk to. Uh, I have clients come to me for psychic stuff and I'll tell them, you know what? You got to let go of the fear of letting go. You got to just let it out. Let it go. You just got to, you got to, you got to embrace the fact that you're going to have rejection in your life. You're going to have things that don't always work out on your, in your, on your behalf, but know that with, with perseverance and the right mindset, it's going to pass you. It's like turbulence on a plane. When I try to explain that to people, I say, anything you're going through, think of it as like turbulence on the plane and it, and it subsides. Or think of it as something that's just a fleeting thing that doesn't last longer than you need it to, because it won't, it does end with every negative thing that happens, that thing comes to an end. And if you think of it that way, when you're going through it, whatever the situation is, I feel like you could have a coping mechanism in place that could keep you from over stressing about it or getting just way too fight or flight feeling, you know, when you're, when your heart goes into your throat and you have that increased feeling of anxiety that we all dealt with. And, and, and you know, one of the things I want to ask you about the pandemic because COVID-19 impacts us still even now, I guess, your personal reflection on the pandemic, how did you encounter that personally for yourself after dealing with all these other things that you've learned to cope with and, and develop, you know, the right mindset with what, what did you, what did you see through the pandemic for yourself? How did it change or if at all influence your, your, your worldview, your life view? I, I think that um, the one thing that the, the pandemic didn't have a really big impact on me. You know, I work with my fears around it. I'm a writer. So I spent a lot of time at home anyway. So it wasn't that big of a shift f for me. Um, I actually really liked the idea of knowing that I could drive into San Francisco and there wasn't going to be a ton of traffic, you know. And I was, I was looking to those things. And then I was also focusing on the country as a whole. I was listening to, to the news, especially CNN. And, you know, we were also in the midst of that, that election. And there was a tremendous amount of anxiety that was happening around the presidential election. And um, so much of it was out of people's control. You know, whether Democrat or Republican, the election was out of the, the, an individual's control. Same, same thing with the, uh, with the epidemic. And what I kept seeing through it is a, a quote. It's a very famous quote from Viktor Frankl, who, who wrote the book, um, I forget what the name of the book is. It's uh never mind. Anyway, look for Victor Frankl. Uh, man's search for meaning. There you go. It's incredible. He's a man who went to uh, was in Auschwitz, and he was put in Auschwitz at the beginning of the war. So he stayed in Auschwitz five years, and uh, he was subjected to incredible degradation and horror. And he came out of it. He, he was a psychiatrist. He was trained uh, psychiatrist. He was the second school, the leader of the second school of, of the Viennese school that Freud founded. Very famous man. And one of the things that he said about his experience when he was asked about how did you cope with being in, the, in Auschwitz, he said, when a, when a man or a woman is faced with a situation that they, that they cannot change, then the challenge is to change themselves. And that goes back to your story and back to my story. And back, and when you think about it, back to everybody's story eventually, ah. you know? Wow. You know, when you brought up Auschwitz, I, I am a World War II kind of, I just watch it like a lot. And I got to go to one concentration camp in Czech Republic when I went and uh, I think I'm trying to think of tourists and staff. I don't say it so well, but it was the one that they didn't really, it wasn't like Auschwitz, but they kind of held them there before they got dispersed to other areas. And I remember when I walked through that area, just being at that location, I felt all that energy 
and it took me a couple of weeks to decompress from it. And, and one of the things I'll say when you were talking about Victor Franco, Franco or Franco, which I want to make sure I say it right. I, I thought to myself how hard and difficult that must be to live through. And you can't experience that unless you're in it yourself. And hopefully we'll never have horrors like that again. But for him to tell you that and for you to pick up on that and bring that up today, to me, it shows a lot about resiliency, the human spirit. That's right. When faced with insurmountable odds. And it also gives us the opportunity to see that no matter if any of our listeners here at hear our conversation today and they're having a really horrible, upset, you know, upsetting day or a traumatic life experience they're going through right now, the one thing I'll say to them is you, you can have more resiliency within you than you'll ever realize you have. You just got to call on it and rely on it and you'll feel that. And, and the way in which you move through that uh, difficulty, that um, emotional difficulty or that difficulty with getting a better perspective on things is through awareness. So let me go, let me go over that process just one more time sure. because it's so critical. The in shifting in the, in shifting in the direction of really waking up and shifting in getting yourself deprogrammed from the silly way that there, our culture is, <laughs> you know, and um, it just boils down to, you know, what you are aware of, you eventually control and what you're unaware of will continue to control you. So again, it's enough for you to simply be watchful and aware. And through that, all that is kind of neurotic within you will begin to drop uh, and, and you'll begin to wake up. Awareness allows you to see, see and fear, you know, what's going on inside you that sabotages your happiness, sabotages your peace. The negativity, the upsets, the pessimism, the aggression, the competitiveness, the shame, the unworthiness, all that. And as you make an unconscious pattern conscious, it does dissolve. I mean, that's what psychotherapy is all about. So the first thing you need to do is get in touch with those negative feelings, beginning with the negative thoughts that are producing those negative feelings. We think our way into upsetting corners. And then when we're, we've backed ourselves into that corner with our thinking, we look out and what we see is a threatening world when there's no threat at all. You know, they did a study at Cornell University that people write down all of their worries over an extended period of time. And then they had to come back and, and indicate which one of the worries did not actually happen. And it turned out 85% of the of the pe what people worried about did not happen. And then somebody, a pessimist always asked me, well, what about the 15% that did? Well, they, they, delved, they dug down into that too. And what they found is 79% of those people that had worries that happened, they worked it out. They turned, you know. It, most things work out. out. That's, most work things work out. out, right? I mean. Exactly. So, so get in touch with those feelings that are upsetting you. Look at the thoughts that are generating those. And the second step is acknowledge the negative feeling is in you, not in reality. You know, you're, you're, if you're afraid, you're, you're, by definition, you're seeing reality, reality in a very distorted way. You're seeing a threat that most time, 97% of the time, it's not even there. You know, that's pretty self-evident, but most people don't get that. Well, you, through awareness, you begin to get it. It's not happening to you. It's happening for you is another shift in perspective. It's trying, it's, it's not trying to torture you. It's tapping you on the shoulder to help you wake up to how you're punishing yourself, how you're, how you're sabotaging your own natural state of freedom. Third step, don't identify with those negative feelings. You're not your negative feelings and don't judge yourself for them. Your upsets have nothing to do with your true self. Don't say I'm depressed or say, you can say my experience at the moment, it's depression, you know, or depression's there. That's fine. If you want to say fear's there, that's fine. But not I'm afraid. You're, you're defining yourself in terms of a feeling and that's your illusion. That's your mistake. In no way does the feeling affect your essential self. The metal talks about it's like throwing black paint into up towards the sky. Does the sky turn Black? No, the paint comes down and dissolves into the ground, right? Same thing with your true nature. You have an upset, you make a mistake, you do something stupid, you overreact, it's black paint going into the air, let it come down, your true nature is still there, always present, always, always with you. So if there's a depression there right now, if there's a worry there right now, let it be, leave it alone, it'll pass. 
everything passes, especially emotions. And then the fourth step is to remember that, that everything passes, especially emotions. And when it does pass, notice the feeling in you. You know, you're free. You're free of all of that. It's, and you begin to see that where you are right now is reality. All of that commotion that you just came out of, that's illusion. And you actually can, from this place of freedom, you look and you, you can really experience and understand none of that upset, none of that commotion is me. This is me. This pure awareness I am right now in this here and now moment, this is where I am. This is where I always am. This, this is where that loving divinity all around me is and that's fulfillment and it comes it doesn't come from outside you it's your natural state that that's the that the way that you've been programmed is has been blocking so do that every day throughout the day and if you remember to do this simple process throughout the day you'll begin to get it and your benefit will be in a few short weeks the quality of your experience is going to change i guarantee it from my personal experience and from working with hundreds and hundreds of people, you're gonna look at yourself, you're gonna be different. You're gonna see yourself responding to life differently. You're much more alive. Your eyes are, are wide open to the truth that people everywhere are searching for, which is that fountainhead of peace and joy that hides yeah. in every human heart. Do that. Within ourselves. That's all you've got to do, that it's, that's all you really need to do to be in a process of waking up just this process of waking up by embracing what's actually happening instead of pushing it away and then watching it you know it's sort of like we put push the upset feelings out the front door and two seconds later you we notice they've come through the back door and they're tapping on my shoulder it's so important to distinguish that and when you were describing the four steps I was thinking in my, in my head, not only is this a positive affirmation exercise, but it's also a spiritual grounding exercise where right. if, you, if you have a lot of anxiety or if you're dealing with a lot of irrational fear, if you, if you go through this line item for, you know, get in touch with your negative feelings, look at yourself and realize that 85% of anything I'm worrying about is never going to happen to me. And if I am one of those 15% of the people affected by something, I'm going to, it's probably going to work its way out on some way. You know, if I'm having, if I'm behind on my mortgage because of COVID, then there'll be people who can work it out with me to make payments or I'll, I can, you know, it's all about mindset perspective, right? It's like where you're at and what you're doing. Yes. Health issues, whatever it is. I mean, own, it's like taking ownership and accountability of what you have control over and the things that you don't have control over. You leave them where they're at because you realize they're not going to likely adversely affect you. It's ab absolutely right. You nailed it. And you know, the important thing to realize is that this programming that we've undergone from society, it's, it's to get us attached. It's get us attached to being a success because we're easier to control. And then now, now we're dependent on other people's approval of us. Attached to having things that we don't even need, objects that we don't even need attached to becoming something other than what we already are. An attachment is an emotional state of clinging that's caused by the belief that without something or some person or some result, you can't be happy. <laughs> and at some point today, I invite your listeners to write down at the top of a piece of paper, I cannot be happy unless or until, and then fill in the blanks. You're going to be shocked at how much stuff you're putting on, it's putting your happiness on pause. For example, I cannot be happy unless my boss appreciates me, or I cannot be happy until I'm out of debt, or I cannot be happy until I'm not neurotic anymore, or I cannot be happy until the pandemic is over. I hear that a lot. You know, anything that's true for you, and then look at the list over and consider that these thoughts, these beliefs block your natural state of happiness. And then you begin to see the three truths that DeMello lays out for us, the three false beliefs, the truth underneath the three false beliefs that DeMello lays out for us that I cannot be happy with without the thing that you're attached to, uh, that you consider so precious. There's not a single moment in your life when you don't have everything you need to be happy. It's in your nature. The second false belief, happiness is in the future. We all live on that. 
Not true. Right here, right now, you are already happy and you don't know it because your false beliefs and your distorted perceptions have gotten you caught up in fears and anxieties and attachments and conflicts and guilt. And, and then the third false belief, happiness will come if I manage to change the situation I'm in and all the people around me. And it's not true. You know, you, we stupidly squander so much energy trying to rearrange the world. You know, if, and we don't, and we never rearrange the world, you know, it's, so let all that go, let all that go. And, and what you will begin to notice as you let these attachments go at first is you, you, you see them and then you understand them, they will let themselves go. And then as you, you operate uh, by, by shifting out of them, you will notice that what arises in and of itself, all by itself is this happy peaceful, loving nature that you were born with and that you were born to live from that's been blocked by all these attachments that society hammered into your head. I wrote down a word, unconditional love, on the piece of paper while you were just describing all these various states. And the other thing I looked at was, as you were stating these, at least my takeaway is, so you're saying happiness lies within ourselves, happiness is now, and we happiness doesn't require any external attachments to occur. Right. And in fact, it's the external attachments. It's the belief that external attachments is, is where, we, where it's going to come from. So we're all running around looking for happiness in all the wrong places. Wow. We're looking for it in a new toaster, a new car, a new girlfriend, a new job. And, you know, DeMello is not about renouncing the material world. But that's really important to get clear for people. One uses the material world and one enjoys the material world, but one doesn't make one's happiness depend on the material world. The irony is, is that when you're detached from the material world as you pursue success, you actually enjoy the process more. Then when, you, you know, when you're believing that your self-worth and your peace of mind and your happiness depend on the outcome, you don't enjoy anything. You're, you're anxious all the time. You're comparing yourself with, to other people all the time and coming up with the short end sure. of the stick. But if you succeed, great. If you fail, your happiness and self-worth are not at stake. That's, that's fulfillment. That's living the good life. I'll add one extra one onto that. <laughs> Don't look at this failure, but look at his life experience. Yes. And if you do that and you're happy about it, <laughs> then you can really have a maximally optimized perspective. Spiritually. Yeah, eventually what might happen is you might, you might begin to gravitate towards but pulling into your life what you love that's been on a back burner for years and years because you're so caught up in trying to live up to what society says you're supposed to be. That's what happened to me at Stanford. You know, when I finally decided to make the shift to leave Stanford, I couldn't tell you how shocked my friends and family were. How could you? That's the medical, one of the medical meccas of the world. You're on top. You know, you're moving <laughs> up. Why are you throwing that away? And I said, because it's, it, it, it's not, I'm not doing what I love to do. What I love to do is working with people. So I'm going to, and so I took that huge leap of faith. I was, I spent a, about a year and a half uh, robbing from Peter to pay Paul financially. But once I got past that, I, I was uh, in a, in working in the field that was really true to my heart, that really made my heart happy as can be. You know, it's like my grandchildren. You know, my grandchildren are over, if they're all getting fussy and, you know, bickering with each other, I throw some paper out on a dining room table and a bunch of crayons and they're happy for <laughs> well that's their nature their nature is our nature is creative we were created by the creator in his likeness that means we're highly creative creatures and you see it in children and i and every time i see that with them i remind myself don't ever give up your creative work don't ever give it up that's that's where your joy is well whatever is the listeners out there are listening, whatever your joy is, find a way to make some more room for it. Maybe it's only got this much room or no room. Maybe you can give it this much room. And what will happen, just like with my grandchildren, it'll expand to this much. Instead of one hour, it's two hours. Now it's three hours a week, that kind of thing. 
you know, that's, that's an amazing way of looking at it too, to, to find your passion and be able to plug into it regularly. And the more you can do it, that's, a, that's, that's a life force. That's a purpose. And whatever you find yourself saying, I love, I love doing that. I hear my wife say that she loves, I don't, I'm not much of a gardener, not much of a cook either. She loves to cook at the end of the day. She doesn't <laughs> work. She loves to go out in the garden. When she comes back in, she's really happy. I tell her, I said, you know, you, you should have owned a nursery. She said, oh, no, it wouldn't have been all business. <laughs> <laughs> I would have worried about, are we making enough money? But, but going into the garden, oh, just her great joy. It's not, uh, she's singing out there. She's talking to the plants, you know. So it's life like minor moments. Where, 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 and that's where you look for your passion, where, where you find yourself thinking, God, I love, I love doing that. I love spending that 15 minutes doing that. I, I can tell you emphatically, I agree with you 100%. I know when we conclude this interview this evening, I'm going to go for a walk outside for 15 minutes at least because of nature and because of Demel. I, 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 that resonates with me. I, I feel That's so honored. Of it. Very good. <laughs> I, I want to put the... Go ahead. People so often say to me, should I meditate? And if you begin to talk... Do you to breathe? Them, you find out <laughs> there are pl places in their lives going for a walk in nature, for example... It's a form of meditation. Gardening in your backyard is a form of meditation. Whatever relaxes you, opens your mind, makes you vulnerable to the beauty around you, that's meditation. Absolutely. I, I, I just got to say, it's been an honor having you on today, just talking to you and having the exchange of the information that we've exchanged with each other and, and realizing that there's synchronicities between your story and what I've gone through the last few years. I'm not diminishing in any way your story, but I'm saying like, spiritually being alerted to like, it's like having the headlights on, you know, making you alert, pay attention, pay attention. Life's more meaningful than the material. And I think that's part of the root of a core essence of, of uh, and enlightening yourself. And I, I just thank you for sharing your personal story and your experiences here because. Oh, this, you didn't, you sharing your story didn't diminish me at all. It, it, it expanded oh, okay. what we're reaching. And you know, Zach, you, you, you are the light of the world. <laughs> You are the light of the world and there's no, there's no two ways about it. And you, every day, Jason, you come on and do this show and meet with <laughs> I love it. Yes. You, you are a shining light on the world and that's what you love. I do. This is my passion. While you were talking, you were talking to me and I was just thinking that to myself. I don't want to make it too obvious to the audience or to you, but I'm like, you're talking to me. It's like the universe is talking to me right now saying you're doing exactly what you love. And this is a passion of yours. And, and you could tell when I smile, I, I mean, my normal day, I'm sure I don't walk around smiling like I'm a lawyer. People probably think there's something wrong with me. Or if I walk down the street and smiling a lot, people always have that automatic suspect like, what's up with that person? But it's endorphins for me. It's like I get. It's like when I give a reading, I get that as well. But this even more than that, like having, I think it's because I have the opportunity of learning from like of the best. And you're one of those, like everyone who comes on my show, I learn from. And I feel like I had this interesting analogy. And I was talking to my mom about this. I said, you know, I feel like I'm I have my own gallery. My mom's like, what do you mean? I go, everybody that comes on my show, it's a snapshot of where they are at that point in time. And it's in my, in my podcast is the gallery of all the great people who come on my show to share their ideas. Oh, some true. of them, some of them come back more than once and we have different shots. Some of them stay or so, you know, it's really cool. And, and I, I, I've, I've even learned to think to myself, to anyone I get to through this, this special situation, I find I, I just feel enlightened by them. And I, I yes. it's an inspiring thing for me. So it's, it's, it's really been a great experience. And I, I am so grateful that you, we got the finally pair. I, I know we had a conversation like a month and a half ago <laughs> and then uh, our schedules ran away from us, but the recircle and be able to do this today really was an honor for me. And I thank you. Well, you know, the first thing I thought when I first saw you, you were smiling, you smile, <laughs> you smile a lot, whether you know it or not, like right now is it, <laughs> I wanted to ask you, have you ever seen a statue of the laughing Buddha? <laughs> With, oh, wait, wrong one. With this your, one? With your hair shaved. Yes. <laughs> Synchronicity, right? I have the angel and the Buddha in me, but I got this one in. <laughs> you you, well, that, well there, that's no accident why you, why you have that. There's so much synchronicity that happens between my show. It started becoming pronounced on the shows, but synchronicity happens all the time in my life the last year and a half since I, you know, I don't know what it, it's just the, the universe is beautiful. The way the synchronicities line up with people and events and things and music and so I, well, well, God love you for, for creating a venue in which people can come and, and experience that and, and come to understand that for themselves. So, yes, thank you. Thank you for, it, for everything you've 
Ben, and thank you for for the gracious way you've been with me. I appreciate it deeply. I appreciate it. I feel like De Mello, De Mello is here in spirit with us. <laughs> Based on the conversation we had, I felt very strongly about that. And I thank that for every in the audience. I just want to thank Don Joseph Goway for coming on the show today. What an amazing guest. Uh, you know, it's just very special to have somebody come on and share insight on such a level. And to go through life changes like that and to experience those life changes and to overcome them and then be able to share that and do so in such a way that is, is really, for me, a blessing today. I, I consider today's episode a blessing. And there was a lot that I learned from this episode, and I'm sure you will as well. But the most important thing I'll say is pay attention to when you're sad. Instead of being sad, try next time to think of when you're happy and follow the ideas that, that we, we just heard today. I mean, employ this methodology. Stop fixing yourself. Wake up all is well is Don Goway's book featuring Anthony DeMeo's teachings and ideals. And I have to do that. I, I really do. This stuff resonates with me. Uh, when I had my cancer diagnosis at the time, I didn't, I didn't really express what happened inside. And it was hard for me. I, I had to try to show a, a strong face. And I'm not ever like, none of us are ever perfect. And we all go through our life situations and we have our bad days. And, you know, but looking back and reflecting on it, I realize now that that helped me shift my paradigm for myself. That if I deal with any adversity, I, I figure out what is it that's really at the core of the issue upsetting me. And then I try to do exactly what one was telling us to do. Um, getting in touch with your emotions and just realizing that these negative feelings aren't going to last. They flow. And when you look at your highs, you can see there's lows in every high and there's high in every low. So it'll even out. And then, you know, you can acknowledge and be aware of those negative feelings for yourself, but realize it's not reality. And so at that point, you start detaching from the attachments of what you've already previously been worried about. And then you can basically say you are not your negative feelings. They exist. You can sit in them for a little while, pity party, call it whatever you want, but you're not your negative feelings. And then you re just remember that this, as you sit in that feeling, you can ride the wave, as Don said, ride the wave, but don't let it overwhelm you. And guess what happens? At some point, you're going to figure out that happiness, <laughs> the inverted stuff that he was saying earlier, happiness, it, it, it lies within ourselves. It's now. You could be happy right now. I'm smiling right now because I'm happy. Yes, I'm happy. I'll admit that. And then also remember that happiness doesn't require any attachments. I don't need a brand new car in my driveway to be happy. I could be happy sitting in this house if we have to go through another lockdown and pray to God we don't. But I could be happy here because I've learned how to be happy here. And so that's my takeaway. Look, this is one of the best episodes for me personally. I love every episode I do. But this one really resonated with me on certain deep levels. And I'm so appreciative that Don came on the show. And I'm going to have his website information in the notes and his contact information. He's, a, he's an amazing guest. And I just appreciate him coming on today and really sharing this stuff. And so check out his book, Stop Fixing Yourself, Wake Up All Is Well. And check out Don. And until next time, stay positive. Because when you're positive, anything's possible. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Social Psychic Radio Show. Don't forget to join us for another episode next time. If you enjoyed the show, we'd love for you to subscribe, rate, and give us a review on iTunes. You can also check us out on Facebook. And don't forget to visit the Social Psychic YouTube channel. Until next time, it's a big world out there. Keep an open mind, embrace your paradigms, and know that the universe is always yours to explore.